Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture on Louis XIV and Absolutism in Western Europe, Unit 3, Section 7, of course, in AP European History. Today's lecture is divided into three parts, and the first part is going to focus on exactly what is absolutism. So our objective for that is to explain how absolutist forms of rule affected social and political development from 1648 to 1815. Now, this is a significant chunk of time, and I want you to pause and think about what is significant about each of those dates. 1648, of course, is the Treaty of Westphalia that brought an end to the Thirty Years' War, and that marks a major turning point in European history. It's the end of the wars of religion, for the most part, but also the rise of uh, sovereign states operating in a secular framework, the rise of absolutism and the Enlightenment and the aristocracy, um, which will really characterize that about 150-year period. And then the second date, 1815, that's also going to be a major turning point because that's going to represent the defeat of Napoleon following the French Revolution. And that turning point really ushers us into the modern era of the 19th century. But that's another story for another day. Moving on to our key concepts, there are several key concepts that are going to apply to this first part. Um, our first key concept is going to tell us about how different models of political sovereignty affected the relationship among states and between states and individuals. In much of Europe, uh, absolute monarchy was established over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries. That one seems pretty obvious. And also, absolute monarchies limited the nobility's participation in governance, but preserved the aristocracy's social position and legal privileges. That's going to be a major theme in the development of absolutism, is how they handle the nobility. And that's really what differentiates absolute monarchs from new monarchs or medieval monarchs before that. And then finally, the new concept of the sovereign state and secular systems of law played a central role in the creation of new political institutions. And so not surprisingly, our major theme for this section is going to be political, political states and other institutions of power. So let's get down to business by starting with the characteristics of absolutism. One of the first and most important characteristics of absolutism is the, this idea of the divine right of kings. The divine right of kings, in many ways, has been around since the days of Charlemagne, when he was crowned Holy, Ro Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in the year 800, which of course established the precedent that the church was above the state, as the church acknowledged the kings, but also it implied that the kings were unique because they were chosen by God to rule. And that theory really becomes prominent and, and important in the days of absolutism. So ultimately, divine right of kings is this idea that a ruler's authority stemmed from God alone and that the king was the absolute authority. So if he's chosen by God to rule, then no one can doubt him. No one can challenge him. No other institution can challenge or put checks on his power. Not the parliament, not the courts, not the universities, maybe not even the church, in fact. But also, with great power comes great responsibility. The king was charged with the responsibility of looking after his people. He was still subject to laws and traditions. So the king could not be this tyrannical, murderous, heathen of a person, right? He still had to be a responsible ruler and fill the duties of kingship. Now, the clerical scholar who really is behind the popularity of this idea of divine right of kings um, is a guy named Jacques Bousset, who was from France, and he really championed the idea of divine right, especially in France, but there, as we know, there are some copycats with this idea of divine right in England. So another key characteristic of absolutism is this concept that the sovereignty of a country is embodied in the person of the ruler. So that means the leadership of the country, the power, even to some extent the identity of a country is embodied in the person of the ruler. 
Um, this was famously encapsulated by Louis XIV's motto, L'État c'est moi, which means I am the state. And therefore, these kings were often very concerned with establishing strong, ambitious dynasties that would last for many years and continue to keep their hold on political power in their state. Another important characteristic of absolutism is that the nobility was effectively brought under control. This is really important with absolutism. And like I said, it's what ultimately differentiates them from the new monarchs. The new monarchs of the 15th and 16th centuries uh, attempted to limit the nobility who had a lot of power during the Middle Ages, but they were only moderately successful. The nobility did still have a lot of autonomy and independence. But really, what really defines the absolute monarchs is how well they are able to control the nobility. So this also is going to contrast with Eastern European absolutism. Now these may, uh, may not be explicit, these next points may not explicitly be on this PowerPoint in front of you, but they are in your notes, so I'm going to make sure we cover them. Like I said, this will contrast with Eastern European absolutism, which we'll, co which we'll cover in another subject, because in Eastern Europe, the nobility remained very powerful. Um, and so we'll talk about how that works another day. And at times, the nobility could still prevent absolute monarchs from completely having their way. We will definitely see some significant challenges to absolutism. Not, not all of them are successful, of course, but you may remember that the English Civil War saw a significant challenge to the Stuart King's attempts at absolutism. Also, bureaucracies in the 17th century were often composed of career officials appointed by and solely accountable to the king. This is another important component of absolute monarchies. Absolute monarchs had to greatly expand their state structure in order to, to increase their authority within a territory. So the bureaucracy are all the departments and the offices and the staff of the government underneath the king and this helps the king expand their control. And the, the people who made up the bureaucracy were often rising members of the bourgeoisie or the new nobility. These members are sometimes called nobles of the robe because they purchased their titles from the monarchy. So again, you want to think of them as new, uh, more scholarly nobility. This also points to the fact that the sale of noble offices and the promotions of bureaucrats would ensure loyalty to the monarch from those groups. So imagine if you are a member of the middle class or uh, a lower bureaucrat and the monarch elevates you to a higher status and higher you know, prestige and privilege you are going to there now be loyal to that monarch and serve him to the best of your ability. And another important function of the bureaucracy, besides building a loyal base to the monarch, is that bureaucracy is allowed for more efficient tax collection in order to fund the government. And absolute monarchs are going to depend on tax collection to fund things like the military and fancy palaces and lots of parties and things like that. Also, the French and Spanish monarchies gained effective control of the Roman Catholic Church in their countries. So some absolute monarchs focused on religious unity as a means of uh, political unity, which does reflect some of the practices of the new monarchs. Like this may remind you of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. So France and Spain remain Catholic but the monarchy is essentially going to create a state church in these countries by controlling ecclesiastical appointments. So they're controlling the appointments of the high level clergy. So this is kind of like the bureaucracy where if they appoint people to these positions of privilege and status, those people in turn will be loyal to the monarch. And also in France and Spain, it was not uncommon for the monarchs to persecute religious minorities as a means of consolidating royal power. Like I said, we definitely saw this in Spain with the new monarchs of Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, but we will also see this in France with Louis XIV. 
Another important characteristic of absolute monarchies is that they maintained large standing armies during peacetime. Um, this was really important because monarchs loved to go to war. And also, this shows that monarchs no longer relied on mercenary armies, which are armies for hire, or noble armies, as had been the case in the 15th century and earlier. So monarchs now had their own armies that were paid by the state, they were loyal to the state, and this is a big development in terms of their, their power and their ability to wage war without relying on the nobility. And another important characteristic is the use of monumentalism in art and architecture, which supported the image that absolute monarchs wanted to cultivate. Um, this was really done in the Baroque style. Baroque art and architecture is most often associated with absolutism because of its opulence and grandeur. So we see this in the beautiful uh, palaces that monarchs build for themselves, like the Palace of Versailles or Schönbrunn later on in Austria, um, impressive capital cities. But the whole idea here is that there's lots of art and architecture, big, grand, dramatic, luxurious art and architecture. And the purpose of it is to glorify the monarch. Now, these absolute monarchs also could be a bit sneaky and a bit Machiavellian, which, frankly, is necessary as an absolute monarch. And so it shouldn't be too surprising to learn that these rulers might employ secret police to weaken political opponents. Now, when I say political opponents, I don't mean like other people running for a position of the king, like we have multiple people running for a position of the president. Political opponents might be critics or unruly nobles or just overall inconvenient, annoying people. And the purpose of the secret police was to make these inconvenient people conveniently disappear. And they did that quite well. But it also, again, thinking about Machiavelli, could potentially instill a sense of fear and obedience in the population because generally, if you conveniently disappeared, you were never heard from again. And so this might be reminding you a bit of some of the totalitarianism and the dictatorships of the 20th century. And this is not an incorrect connection. Absolutism foreshadowed the totalitarianism of the 20th century, but ultimately it lacked the financial, the technological, and the military resources of 20th century dictators like Stalin and Hitler. So absolute monarchs will never have the complete level of total control that Stalin and Hitler had because they don't have really the technology and the military um, to support it. Uh, so because of that, we really reserve the term totalitarianism and dictatorship to the 20th century. Now, both absolutism and totalitarianism are what we would consider to be authoritarian forms of leadership. Um, but the terminology here is important. We use the term absolutism in the context of the 17th and 18th centuries, and we use the term totalitarianism in the context of the 20th century. And in addition, absolute monarchs usually did not require total mass participation in support of the of the monarch's goals. As long as you were complacent and you didn't get in the way, that was fine. And this, of course, is a significant contrast to the totalitarian programs that we do see in the 20th century. Things like collectivization in Russia or Hitler Youth in Nazi Germany, those states demanded complete obedience and loyalty from their citizens. Whereas in absolute monarchies, those who did not overtly oppose the state were usually left alone by the government. Now, some other important foundations of absolutism can be found in some philosophy, some political philosophy that justifies the ideas of absolutism. So we're going to talk about three political philosophers and how they contribute and how they would contribute to the philosophy of absolutism. And we'll start with Jean Baudin. Jean Baudin was a French political science scientist, for lack of a better phrase, and he was among the first to provide a secular theoretical basis for absolutist states. 
Now look at those dates when he lived. He lived in the 16th century. So this means he lived and wrote during the chaos of the French Civil Wars of the 16th century. So he saw the violence and the anarchy and the chaos of those 30 years in the later centuries. So it's not surprising, given, given his perspective and point of view, that he would advocate, advocate, advocate for absolutism and a strong authoritarian government. He believed that only absolutism could provide order and force people to obey the government. But more importantly than Jean Baudin is actually an Englishman named Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes is the political philosopher we most often associate with authoritarian political practice. So Tobbes' famous work here is called The Leviathan. You definitely want to know that. Thomas Hobbes wrote The Leviathan. Thomas Hobbes wrote The Leviathan. Make sure you get that down. Now, Thomas Hobbes supports authoritarianism, but has a slightly different take on it. He articulated a really pessimistic view of human beings in a state of nature. So he argued that if human beings lived in a state of nature, like there was no government or infrastructure or any other sort of human created structure or society, that we would just be barbarians. He said that in a state of nature, human life would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutus, and short. He believed that ultimately it would be anarchy, it would be chaos, and this is because the central drive in every person is power. And so a leader must be aware of this, that human beings are, are, are violent, that they are driven by this desire for power, um, and I'm wondering, does this remind you of any other political philosopher that we have discussed, maybe stemming from, oh, I don't know, the Renaissance and Florence, Italy? And if these ideas do remind you of that political philosopher, maybe you want to jot his name down in the column to help you remember that connection. But anyways... Thomas Hobbes stated that political sovereignty, which means like leadership and power, is derived from the people who transfer it to the monarchy by implicit contract. So this is one of many interpretations of this concept known as the social contract, which is essentially this implied relationship between the government and the people. So he believed that people would ultimately give up certain rights in order to receive protection from an authoritarian government. That go the job of that government was to maintain peace and order and stability and protect the people. And in return for that peace and that order and stability, the people would give up certain rights. Now, his interpretation of this is that the people would give up a lot of rights to an authoritarian government. But we will see as we study more and more political philosophy that different political philosophers have different interpretations of the social contract, and we'll have opportunities to compare that at a later date. So these ideas ultimately are used to justify the concept of absolute monarchy. However, Hobbes did not support the notion of the divine right of kings. So his philosophy is entirely secular. This is one of the reasons, sorry, that's Bowie barking in the background there. Uh, he's clearly not a fan of absolutism. So this is one of the reasons that Hobbes' ideas are identified with Voltaire in the 18th century and Voltaire's concept of enlightened despotism. So as a result, Hobbes' ideas were not actually very popular in the 17th century, since he did not favor the divine right of kings, which seemed to be a more justifiable idea to support absolutism. And the divine right was really embraced by Louis XIV in France and also the Stuart kings in England. And then, of course, when we look at the flip side of politics, those who had constitutional ideas like John Locke and some other members of, of England in the later 17th century, they saw Hobbes' ideas as far too authoritarian. But Hobbes is still considered to be one of the leading political philosophers on authoritarian political philosophy. 
And lastly, we have Bishop Jacques Benet Bousset. Um, and he, this is the French clerical scholar I mentioned earlier who really championed this idea of the divine right of kings in France during the reign of Louis XIV. So again, this idea of divine right means that the king is placed on the throne by God and therefore he owes his authority to no man or no group. No one can challenge his power. And I included this portrait of a young Louis XIV to help us sort of understand this idea and this image that the absolute monarch was trying to convey. So look for a moment at this portrait of Louis XIV and take note of what you see. Louis XIV is riding this big, powerful horse who's rearing up. So, of course, that's going to be a symbol for his masculinity and his, and his, and his control. He's also dressed as a Roman emperor, so he's very deliberately trying to draw those connections between his legacy as a French king and the legacy of ancient Rome. And then we have the angel above him crowning him with a laurel. So the angel, of course, represents the divine spirit and that idea of divine right. But the laurel, of course, comes from ancient Rome and it represents wisdom as well as leadership. So this painting, which is ultimately a piece of political propaganda, is telling us about how Louis is this powerful masculine king. He's a military leader. He's he's just like Roman generals, he's appointed by God, and we are just lucky to be his subjects. So I'm going to pause for a moment to deal with my barking dog. So please make sure you stay, you watch the second video, which is going to be part two of the, uh, the of absolutism and Louis the 14th.